2009. Barack Obama is sworn in as the 44th president of the United States. The recession that started in 2007 was as bad as ever after the financial crash the year prior. Sully becomes a folk hero after safely landing a damaged plane in the Hudson River. The world unexpectedly lost Michael Jackson. The H1N1 swine flu pandemic sweeps the world. Powerhouses Lakers, Yankees, Steelers, and Alabama football stake their rightful claim atop their respective sports. And the Penguins take the cup in seven. Slumdog Millionaire wins Best Picture, Coldplay takes Song of the Year with Viva La Vida, and Kanye has a message for everyone. I'm really happy for you. I'm gonna let you finish. But Airtime Thrills. They have one of the best videos of all time. 2009 was also an interesting year for the theme park industry, sitting right in the teeth of the terrible recession, where people weren't as able or willing to spend their money on leisure. Parks around the world had to find a way to survive in their new environment, and that's a major theme in this video. But that's not all. 2009 also saw beginnings and endings, acquisitions and accidents, and today, I'm going to pick the best ones and rank them up. These are the events that changed the theme park industry from 2009. There were actually a ton of stories from 2009, so let's run through the ones that couldn't make this list. And now for the top 10. September 16th, 2009, 4 o'clock p.m. Accelerator at Knott's Berry Farm launches riders from 0 to 82 miles per hour in 2.3 seconds, like it's done over the past seven years. But this time, just four seconds into the ride, the launch cable snapped. The incident was caught on camera, and you can see the metal fragments flying at the riders in the front row. Two people were injured, but the notable victim of the incident was a 12-year-old boy who had his left leg lacerated by debris and required multiple surgeries to repair the damaged muscle tissue. Knott's claimed the cable was replaced the prior December and was not due for replacement again until it reached one year of service. This would not be the last time the accelerator cable would snap. It happened again in August of 2013, but luckily nobody was injured. The boy in the 2009 incident was not so lucky and his family won a lawsuit against the park and received an undisclosed amount of money. Hard Rock Park opened its gates in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina in 2008. It was a park themed to rock music, as you might expect. Despite its unique nature and good reviews, the bad economy hurt tourism and their advertising strategy and the park had to close down a month early, lay off its employees, and file for Chapter 11 bankruptcy after its opening season. But there was hope for the future. February 16th, 2009. Hard Rock Park was sold to FPI MB Entertainment for $25 million, a fraction of the $400 million it cost to build. And the new owners felt that the Hard Rock brand was damaging, given the very public bankruptcy the park had the prior year. It would now be called Freestyle Music Park and would celebrate all kinds of music genres. Every single coaster opened up in 2009 with a new name. The park offered deep discounts on their tickets and passes to attract more guests, but bringing in less revenue. Despite the president of FPI being optimistic about the progress made in 2009, when it shut down for the season, it would never reopen. The theme park markets of Southern California and Orlando, Florida are dominated by two major players, Disney and Universal. 
Both companies thrive off marketing their intellectual property and turning them into rides, attractions, and shows that bring in tens of millions of people every year. August 31st, 2009. Disney completes a deal to acquire Marvel Entertainment for $4 billion. People speculated that this could spell trouble for Universal's Islands of Adventure's Marvel Superhero Island, featuring some of their most popular attractions. But in reality, the joke was on Disney. Universal's deal with Marvel gave them exclusive rights to the brand east of the Mississippi River, meaning that not only was Marvel Superhero Island safe, Disney would have to work with Universal to put Marvel characters in their Orlando parks. This is why the Avengers Campus is popping up in California, Hong Kong, and France, but not in Florida. There is a rumored agreement that Disney can use Marvel characters that are not referenced in Islands of Adventure, which is why Epcot is getting a Guardians of the Galaxy coaster. But despite that deal that cost Disney $4 billion in 2009, Universal still has a stranglehold on the Marvel brand in Orlando. Mock Rides is a company that dates back to 1780, but started making coasters in 1958. They flooded the market with mine trains, powered coasters, some bobsleds, and in the 90s, they made a name for themselves with wild mouse coasters. The Mock family also owns Europa Park, consistently voted the world's best park in the Golden Ticket Awards. And they used this as the testing ground for some of their new creations. In 2009, they would unveil something that would bring them to the adults table of coaster manufacturers. April 4th, 2009. Blue Fire Mega Coaster opens to the public, the Mock Rides launched looping coaster. Mock wasn't just that wild mouse company anymore, as parks all over the world wanted this launched model, some with inversions and some without. Mock would capitalize on this with other well-received models like their Hypercoaster and Extreme Spinner. And Mock continues to be a major player in the coaster world today. Nine years into its life, and under its second owner, Son of Beast at Kings Island already had quite a reputation. The fanfare around it back in 2000 was enormous, as the first wooden coaster to crack the 200-foot mark and the first modern wooden coaster to feature a vertical loop. During its first season, the park sued the companies in charge of construction because of their shoddy work. The coaster was a problem from the start, with the most famous incident occurring in 2006 when a cracked beam led to a jolt that sent 27 people to the hospital and led to the coaster getting new, lighter trains that required the removal of the vertical loop. Cedar Fair seemed to have little patience for this troubled coaster when they took over in 2007. June 16th, 2009. A woman reported that 17 days earlier, she suffered a burst blood vessel in her brain after riding Son of Beast. The ride was shut down for investigation, but there were no irregularities found. The ride was just naturally terrible. 2009 was Son of Beast's last stand. Following the investigation, the park would never reopen the coaster. March 16th, 2009. Six Flags announces that the Texas Giant at Over Texas will not open for the 2010 season and will be renovated for the park and the chain's 50th anniversary in 2011. The renovation would cost $10 million. With Six Flags in a terrible financial situation, people were complaining about the chain blowing $10 million on renovating an old rough wooden coaster rather than spending the money on a new coaster. At the time, renovating a wooden coaster meant retracking the rough parts and fixing up the structure. Nobody could envision what they could do to it that would cost $10 million. Soon enough, they would learn just what $10 million could do. Six Flags decided to disclose that they were gonna renovate the coaster and how much it would cost, but they didn't mention that they would be giving Rocky Mountain Construction their first shot at an iron horse conversion, taking a wooden coaster and turning it into a steel track hybrid. This would be the go-to move for Six Flags while rebuilding their company, building elite thrill coasters on the cheap, as RMC established themselves as one of the best in the business. Following the financial crash of 2007 and 2008, the economy was in the toilet in 2009. Theme parks, especially those considered destination parks, were an expense that could be cut out of people's budgets. Disney was determined not to let that happen. They managed to keep people coming through the gates by offering something that everyone can appreciate, discounts. They started offering free admission for everyone on their birthday, a promotion that registered more than 3 million people in its first year and drove up attendance by 10% in the third quarter compared to 2008. They also discounted their other tickets, including a three-day park hopper at Disneyland for just $99.
These discounts caused Disney to break even by the end of the summer in 2009 albeit with a 19% profit loss. But given the circumstances, continuing to entertain their loyal customers was a victory, and was certainly not the case with their competitors. Six Flags and Cedar Fair had a very ambitious decade leading up to 2009. Six Flags had made multiple major investments and acquired new properties earlier in the decade. And Cedar Fair just about doubled their assets with their acquisitions between 2004 and 2006. The financial crash came at a terrible time for both chains. In November, Cedar Fair announced that it would not be paying its limited partner units. This was done in order to conserve cash and pay down the debt from acquiring the Paramount Parks. The chain said their attendance was down, mainly because of the decline in group sales. Both businesses and schools were cutting these visits out of their budget. Six Flags indicated this as a major reason for their attendance issues also. The financials were ugly. Six Flags lost $74.8 million over the first nine months of the year, compared to the $147.3 million profit over the first nine months the year prior. By the end of the summer of 2009, Cedar Fair also reported a 50% decline in profit, and were looking to sell off excess land around Geauga Lake, as well as get California's Great America, Valley Fair, and Worlds of Fun off their ledger. Both chains were falling apart given the circumstances, but they went off in two very different directions. December 16th, 2009. Apollo Global Management agreed to a $2.4 billion buyout of Cedar Fair. This relieved the chain of their debt from the Paramount acquisition, a total which stood at $1.6 billion. This debt had scared investors away from the chain in the years leading up to this buyout. News of the deal caused Cedar Fair stock to jump 23% in one day. It also showed that Apollo Global Management had faith in the amusement park industry after a terrible year, and that 2009 was in fact rock bottom, and they would see steady improvement from then on. Cedar Fair's acquisitions had stretched them thin financially, but they were solid business moves, and Apollo recognized what they had and their potential success when the economy recovered. 11 years down the road, safe to say that they were correct. Cedar Fair stands as a stable and successful brand in the industry. And then there's their main competitor. March 11th, 2009. Six Flags told the US Securities and Exchange Commission that if they could not restructure their debt prior to their $300 million in payments that year, they would have to declare bankruptcy. With the banks in bad shape, there was little chance that Six Flags would be able to refinance. Five days later, CEO Mark Shapiro stated that one of the company's biggest debt holders was not returning calls to help them restructure their debt outside of the courts. So they were left no choice other than to deal with it inside the courts. June 13th, 2009. Six Flags files for Chapter 11 bankruptcy, citing $2 billion of debt thanks to their aggressive expansion the decade prior and the failing economy pushing an already bad situation over the edge. Shapiro said that the plan was to cut off all the debt so the company can rise up and be as competitive as ever. The court would oversee the restructuring of the company's debt, and after basically taking an off year in 2010, Six Flags would come back strong in 2011. Strong, but different. They celebrated the chain's 50th anniversary with New Texas Giant, taking an inexpensive chance on the brand new Rocky Mountain construction, which would lead to a prosperous relationship for both companies over the next decade, and would continue to add small and cloned additions to every park every year. The 2009 bankruptcy was the birth of Six Flags' new identity as the discount chain, a controversial tactic that has been the subject of debate for years. That's a wrap for 2009, a year driven by the world economy, and a really interesting year for anyone interested in park finances. Let me know what you think was the most important story of the year, and what you may have added or rearranged on my list. Before you leave, don't forget to leave a like. That's the best way to show your support for the channel. And if you're into this style of video, check out my playlist with the other years that I've done so far and hit that subscribe button for more content just like this. Thank you all for watching and I'll see you all next time.